Um, okay, so I think um, I think we're all uh, good to go. That's the uh, housekeeper out of the way. Um, what I'd like to do is welcome everyone to this uh, session. Um, this has been organised by the Fabians and uh, co-organised by uh, an economics group that I'm involved with, Region 1 um, Economics Group. Um, yeah, we're certainly extremely pleased to have uh, Bill uh, uh, join us. I'll uh, um, give you a little bit of background about Bill very shortly. Uh, this sort of uh, continues a series of Zoom meetups that we've had over the last sound. three or four months. And I can't get it. Uh, in particular, uh, covering you know new economic ideas that are out there. We've been looking at things like the Green New Deal and a lot of the things that have come out of that, including uh, the job guarantee. Um, uh, also known as real full employment as opposed to the phony full employment that we've been uh, hoodwinked into accepting over the past uh, recent decades. Um, and, uh, and obviously how to use this uh, COVID-19 response to build a better and fairer and greener uh, economy and society. Um, and to that effect, I think it would be fair to say that our speaker, um, Professor Bill Mitchell, has probably been at this for um, you know decades rather than years or months. Um, his entire career really, I think, has been sort of focused on exactly the issues that are now front and center of the debate. Um, Bill uh, is Professor of Economics and Director of the Center of Full Employment and Equity at the University of Newcastle. Um, his seminal work on job guarantee schemes has attracted international attention and application. And as many of you know, uh, Bill is one of the founders of modern monetary theory, uh, which is causing a major rethink of many of economics core principles. So we're especially pleased to have Bill with us today. His recent books include Reclaiming the State, A Progressive Vision of Sovereignty for a Post-Neoliberal World, uh, and Macroeconomics, a, a textbook that finally is available to, uh, I think, first year economics uh, students that gives a much better perspective on economics. Um, Bill is going to speak for about 30 or 40 minutes and um, we will then open up to uh, general discussion and questions. Uh, and as I mentioned, feel free to use either the chat or to raise your hand at the end of the session. So without further ado, um, I'm going to hand over to Bill. I think Bill's got a, a slideshow, so we'll probably want to do a, present, a, a slide share. Um, over to you, Bill. Okay, well, thanks very much. And um, thanks very much for giving up your Sunday afternoon. It's a lovely day on the east coast of uh, Australia at the moment very sunny. I'm just looking at my office window here and uh, I'm assured that it's a, a nice day over there. So thanks very much for staying indoors and taking the time and being committed to um, advancing sort of education and knowledge that uh, will help us hopefully alter the political debate somewhat. So I'm just going to uh, share my screen and there's a few slides. I, I don't have heaps of slides. Uh, I'm presuming, I've just got to check this, get this slideshow working. Um, just bear with me for a moment. What's happened there? Um, so I want the slideshow and I want to play it from the start. Okay, is it, uh, can everybody see that? Right, can you see, can you see the slideshow now? Yes. Uh, okay, fine. So what I want to briefly talk about is some of the ideas behind this concept of a paradigm shift going on at the moment and uh, uh, some specific aspects. So this is, <laughs> this is from a US philosopher. He's very famous. Uh, simply no polite way of telling people that they've dedicated their lives to an illusion. <laughs> 
And uh, for most of us, uh, we've been part of that illusion or the fictional world that I talk about in economics. And for many of us, even though we're well-intentioned, we've made political choices based upon living that within that fictional world that's been created by mainstream economists. And uh, the reason we've got to break out of that fictional world is because these things that I'm going to talk about today are, are constants and in, very important in our lives. Uh, a lot of people sort of turn their nose up and say, oh, economics, for God's sake. But it's constantly in our lives and it's, and it's a driving force in, our, in the way in which uh, political decisions are made, uh, which, which directly affect our well-being. And the problem is that uh, macroeconomic concepts are quite difficult, even for students who are in economics. Uh, the concept of a macroeconomic aggregate is quite an abstract concept. You, uh, it's, it's quite difficult to actually get your head around that. And uh, one of the things that, um, uh, that I'm aware of these days is that social media is really exacerbating that uh, lack of understanding, that difficulty. And uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, so-called experts on social media. And, and I'm not talking about critics of my work, but also those who uh, might have a predilection to it. But uh, uh, it's, not a, it's not a great place, social media, for debate. Um, and the other, the other aspect is that uh, macroeconomics has been housed within all sorts of different ideological agendas that abuse the difficulty of the concepts and, uh, and, and create this fictional world. And the, the whole neoliberal agenda over the last three or four decades, depending on where you live, relies on you and I being ignorant about macroeconomics. They exploit the fact that we're ignorant. They build up our ignorance through very sophisticated framing and language. And they exploit that to pursue agendas that, and, in, and co-opt us into being part of their agenda setting through the political process and, and, the sort of, and social media. And... Uh, uh, those agendas have progressively undermined our prosperity. And what modern monetary theory is, is a new way of thinking about macroeconomics that I believe gives the progressive side of politics hope. So that's sort of what I'm going to talk about. So full employment era, what did we learn from that? 19, uh, the, the, the Great Depression taught us one thing, and that was that the government could use its fiscal capacity, that's spending and taxation, to... Pre there, there's a bit of noise there. Uh, could, could use its fiscal and uh, policy capacity to create unemployment and to create full employment. And what, what the Great Depression taught us was that uh, capitalism left without that government support and government intervention would create crisis and large amounts of unemployment. It was, it was endemic to, the, to a, an unregulated capitalist system without strong fiscal support. Now, the, the Great Depression didn't really end until the end of the 30s and uh, with the prosecution of the war and the large deficits that accompanied that prosecution. And, th and that clearly taught, taught governments that uh, strong fiscal support, spending support, would, would create work and production and income growth. And the Great Depression unemployment ended with that military effort. Now, the problem in the, the early days of the peace in the 40s was, well, how are we going to continue to maintain that full employment uh, and that fiscal support without blowing the hell out of each other, having to uh, build tanks and armaments and things like that. 
and most governments in 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 around the world had major policy statements in the in Australia, it was the 1945 white paper on full employment. And they, these were very familiar all around the world where governments committed to nation building, to using its fiscal support uh, consistently to maintain sufficient spending so that when the non-government sector uh, wanted to save overall uh, and withdraw some of their income from spending, the economy didn't go into recession and instead would remain at full employment with that fiscal support. That's what the full employment era taught us. And it was quite clearly understood then that any unemployment that was uh, realised was due to a lack of spending and uh, was a systematic uh, failure of the, of the economy to produce enough jobs. It was nothing to do with the individuals who, who were the victims of the lack of spending and that the solution was quite clear that we needed to use uh, fiscal capacity to, to redress that spending gap. So they were, the, they were the things that were understood throughout the 1940s, 50s, 60s, into the 70s. The breakdown in that consensus occurred in the early uh, 70s. Now, it wasn't, it wasn't a very uh, a rapid paradigm shift in the sense that the, the monetarists, Milton Friedman and his gang, were, were at their program for many years earlier. Uh, they were fighting against the social democratic uh, consensus in the 1950s and the 60s. And what, what allowed them to gain ascendancy in the academy which then filtered out into the uh, policy making processes within central banks and treasuries, for example, uh, and then broadly into the population, was the uh, dislocation related to the oil crises, the OPEC oil hot price hikes, first of all in October 73, and then a bit later on, which caused uh, you know, dramatic shift. Uh, it was a huge supply shock, we call it in jargon. The price of oil doubled overnight virtually and for oil dependent nations that caused a huge shock uh, that the governments were uh, underprepared and, and really did, hadn't worked out how to deal with properly. And of course we had uh, double digit inflation almost everywhere and the way in which governments responded was exactly the wrong way and to create uh, large scale unemployment which disciplined the inflation process but cause massive damage. But in, the, in the, that disjuncture, uh, monetarism assumed a credibility that it didn't deserve. And uh, there, was a, there was a paradigm shift. So in my lifetime, uh, I've seen one paradigm shift in economics, which tells me that they happen. Uh, now, the interesting thing, uh, and we deal with this in the book, Reclaiming the State, was that at, at that time also, the world was opening up and uh, uh, trade was becoming more global, uh, uh, more rapid escalation of trade, but particularly financial capital flows were, were much larger in the late 60s and the, into the 70s. And part of this monetary story which was started to the creation of this fictional world was that nation states, the fiscal capacity that nation states had used throughout that full employment era was now no longer effective uh, uh, against the power of global financial capital. And uh, this was an agenda that was uh, uh, prosecuted very vigorously by the conservatives. And of course, this played into their political agenda that they wanted to uh, stop social demo democratic governments uh, running welfare states and, to co and they wanted to confine the fiscal capacity of nation states to under underpinning profitability of capital. And there was a very famous document in 1971 uh, uh, commissioned by the uh, US Chamber of Commerce. Uh, they commissioned a lawyer called Lewis Powell uh, 
uh, and this is the so-called power manifesto and it's available to read i've written about it uh, and this was a strategic agenda where the right could fight where capital uh, could fight back against the social democratic forces uh, take over the media create think tanks infiltrate the education system and, in, and get rid of the lefties and so on so forth and that set the agenda for capital which which you know they used the uh, concepts of monetarism uh, to their advantage now you know at that time in australia i was uh, just a, a young uh, student but the big big debates and these were worldwide debates were trade union power the profit squeeze and all of these things and and the agenda was quite clear they wanted to uh, uh, break down the social democratic cons consensus and you know we've now got uh, in the 50-year archive rules of cabinet documents in Australia from 68 for example we've now can see that the you know the big bosses of the peak bodies of uh, industry were writing letters to our the Australian treasurer uh, implore him imploring him to uh, create more unemployment deliberately to uh, break the power of trade unions and discipline the wage process so that uh, there could be a redistribution of national income towards profit away from wages. Now, it's quite blatant what was going on. But the, the problem was that the, the political left bought the whole fiction. And, you know, the, if, if you want to trace the origins of uh, political support for monetarism, uh, it comes from originally from the left. And, you know, the famous statement by Jim Callaghan in the, at the uh, Labor annual conference in Blackpool in 1976 in September, where he made the statement that the idea that governments can use fiscal uh, spending to create work is dead. We no longer believe that. Now the responsibility of the government is to fight inflation and to appease, these are my words, uh, uh, international capital. And, you know, you can go through several other turning points. Uh, Jim Callaghan laid the groundwork for Thatcher. It was, Thatcher wasn't the first monetarist government. The, the second Wilson government when Callaghan took over was. And then you had the Mitterrand government in 1983 in France, elected on an anti-austerity platform to re-nationalise and to restore uh, growth and prosperity to the working class. In 1983, they did the famous austerity term, which was, uh, you know, James, uh, Jacques Delors was the economy minister in that so-called socialist government. And they were monetarists. And I mean, Jacques Delors went on to become the president of the European Commission and subsequently the uh, chair of the Delors committee, which, which was the blueprint for the Maastricht Treaty, which was the whole eurozone creation and the, you know the eurozone is the, the 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 one of the most advanced expressions of uh, of neoliberalism that you can get that's that started in the left and you know i mean closer to home uh, hawke and keating they were neoliberals and so was longy and uh, douglas in in your country they they were neoliberals laying the groundwork for hawke uh, for howard and costello here and for um, your national government that followed them. And the, the left bought it all. They believed uh, that, that uh, uh, the nation state was no longer had the capacity to maintain full employment. They no longer believed that fiscal policy was uh, uh, possible in, in, in any coherent form because the, glo the amorphous global uh, the powers of global capital would uh, sell the country down the drain, uh, crash its exchange rate and uh, all of these, and the bond markets would stop funding the governments. Now, what really was going on and what the conservatives knew damn well was going on was that they couldn't, and short of having private militias in invading countries, and sometimes they did that, but generally they don't do that. 
gen and what they understood was if they wanted to uh, operationalize their agenda they had to do it through these the legislative and regulative capacity of the state and so what really happened was not that the nation state disappeared or anything which is what the left believed but that the state was reconfigured in the neoliberal pattern and all of the things that we associate with neoliberalism they've all been accomplished through the legislative and regulative capacity of the state unless the nation state the 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 the, the elected officials had have gone along with it the agenda could not have occurred and so really what the challenge for the left is is to reclaim the state uh, uh, interestingly, at this time, all of this was starting in the early 70s, the, the post-war uh, uh, fixed exchange rate system, the Bretton Woods system, which began in 1946 as a means of uh, providing international stability of exchange rates and certainty of exchange rates. So uh, uh, to provide some certainty for trading in this, in this so-called glorious full employment consensus, that, that broke down in 19, August 1971 when President Nixon uh, uh, suspended convertibility of the US dollar into gold and floated the US dollar and most other uh, currencies floated after that. Now, the importance of that, and this is a separate talk, but uh, and I won't seek to explain it. The importance of that was that during the Bretton Woods period, governments had to be very careful how much currency was in the system because the central banks had to maintain the, under the agreement, the Bretton Woods agreement, had to maintain the, the, the agreed parities across the, all of the exchange rates. And those parities were influenced by how much of the currency was floating around in the economies, in the world economy. And as a consequence, if fiscal policy uh, uh, injected too much currency into the system, then there would be pressures on the exchange rate down and the central bank would have to uh, uh, react to that pressure by withdrawing the currency uh, or pushing up interest rates. And so you had this sort of stop-go dilemma where the central bank, and particularly for countries with external deficits, who were always facing downward pressure on the exchange rate, they, had, uh, they were always being pressured to have uh, higher interest rates or uh, austerity type fiscal policies, which then pushed up unemployment and it became politically unsustainable really to maintain that system, uh, quite apart from the challenges of the US economy, maintaining the gold convertibility. And so, you know, I could go on for a long time about that. But the important point is that in August 71, when that system essentially collapsed, it took a couple of years to really collapse. But when that collapsed, the central banks were no longer responsible for maintaining exchange rate values. So they didn't have to maintain higher interest rates and, and uh, try to constrain uh, monetary growth. And fiscal policy was no longer going to compromise the central bank's exchange rate management. And so governments no longer really needed to issue any debt to cover its deficits. And, and we learned very clearly then that taxation revenue no, didn't, wasn't necessary to fund government spending. Now, that, that realisation was not uniformly uh, disclosed to the public by economists and the mainstream of uh, profession and the teaching programs and the rest of it continued on as if the world hadn't changed. But the Bret collapse of the Bretton Woods system was a dramatic change and that's really where the modern in modern monetary policy comes from. It comes from that shift in the monetary system after 71. So after all of that, this is the neoliberal support card. I'm not going to go through every line. You can uh, look at a couple of those things and tick them and uh, realise that in different countries, some of these things are more, some of these uh, uh, things are more, more pre prevalent than in other countries. But broadly across the globe, uh, 
uh, these type of outcomes have occurred. Okay, paradigm shift. What's, what's happening is that that report card is now resonating. It's taken uh, 30 years, but it's the accumulated damage of those failures of the neoliberal period are now resonating and there's a paradigm shift underway. And the drivers are quite dis diverse. You've got anti-establishment revolts going on among citizens who realise that the promise that was held out to them of, of wealth and prosperity, if they pulled their wage demands in and they voted for governments that privatised and outsourced and put in user pays and uh, uh, all of the rest of it, uh, that those promises have failed to deliver. And, you know, what's the manifestation of that? Uh, yellow vests in France, uh, Brexit vote, Trump, uh, the rise of the right uh, in the political sense, the, the, the demise of social democratic uh, political parties mainly around the world. Some of them now are virtually unelectable uh, because they, they played the neoliberal game thinking that was smart. Uh, another set of driver, drivers is coming from central bankers now who uh, the, the, the neoliberal consensus uh, uh, ensured that most of the policy action would come from monetary policy, setting interest rates, and uh, would, would be biased towards fiscal austerity, running, trying to run surpluses as best uh, as the strategy. And of course, monetary policy, uh, the austerity from the fiscal policy has been driving this sort of stagnation, uh, low productivity growth, flat wages growth, uh, uh, bordering now on deflation and, and all of those things in that report card. And central bankers are realising that they're, they're the ones that have been uh, 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 made front and centre of the policy response and they've run out of uh, policies. They, they've realised that uh, 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 setting uh, swap changing interest rates isn't very effective it doesn't do very much to stimulate demand or whatever and uh, they've they've progressively pushed uh, interest rates to zero and in some some areas in uh, they're negative now and st still stagnation and they're now calling for they're sick of being blamed and they're now causing calling on treasuries to use fiscal policy which has been eschewed under the neoliberal period. And the third sort of drivers are coming from the financial community who realise that their business models have been undermined by this neoliberal period. Why? Because they can't make a buck on negative interest rates. They can't make a buck when public infrastructure has been degraded and uh, run down by fiscal austerity because they've been used to uh, being partners in... Uh, 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 those large public infrastructure projects and as they're being uh, uh, cut back through the austerity they're running out of safe investment uh, uh, areas the, uh, the financial markets and you've got situations where I gave a talk in uh, to PIMCO one of the largest bond uh, traders and, and we were talking about uh, uh, the, the, the maturity mismatch in the big European pension insurance funds. What does that mean? It means that they've got long-term liabilities which need cash flow, you know, pensions and paying out on insurance contracts, etc. And they use their asset structures to generate returns that are timed in an appropriate way so they can meet the cash demands of their liabilities. And with negative interest rates and drying up infrastructure opportunities, their asset structure is unable to generate the appropriate cash returns to meet their liabilities. That's called negative maturity mismatch. Now, what are they, what are they doing? Well, to, to meet their liabilities and keep their cash flow going in a timely way, that's the maturity way, they're increasingly shifting their asset portfolios into much more risky positions because they can generate higher returns than the negative returns that, and low returns on safe assets. And that's exposing the whole financial system, system to collapse. 
So there's this paradigm shift being driven by all sorts of diff different forces that would not normally be seen on the same page together. And this has, of course, led to a strong interest in, in my work and in modern monetary theory. Okay, groupthink still prevails. Why has it taken so long? Why have we been working on this MMT project for 25 years and it's only now that we're getting um, uh, traction? Well, the, the understanding comes from social psychologists and this is a whole area of groupthink, that even when a paradigm is degenerating, which means that it can no longer explain very much about anything that's of interest, the the dominance of the paradigm hangs on. And uh, uh, I hope you can see this table. This is why we should, this is why the mainstream should be jettisoned. And I'll just uh, talk briefly about this. Japan's a very good example. Japan, Japan was really the first post neoliberal government because when, when it had its huge commercial property collapse in the early 90s, uh, it uh, took dramatic action in terms of increasing fiscal deficits and providing monetary support to uh, prevent the commercial property collapse becoming a major recession. So they've had consistently large fiscal deficits, above 10% occasionally, since 91. The mainstream of my profession predicted rising interest rates and rising bond yields. The reality is that short-term interest rates since 91 have been around zero. Bond yields are consistently low and they've been negative for many years now in certain maturity ranges and they've had low unemployment throughout. They had one negative quarter of, of GDP after the commercial property crash. Now you think of the G GFC was a small property crash compared to what Japan had in the early 90s. Uh, Japan has a second row, gross public debt to GDP of largest in the world, it's nearly 250%. My profession said that that would mean that bond markets would uh, uh, start assuming that that, that excessive debt would become uh, un unable to be repaid and that they would demand increasingly higher bond yields if they were to continue lending to J Japanese government. And of course, as I said, across the maturity range, yields have been falling towards zero and the private bids in bond auctions for Japanese government bonds have been huge. Huge demand for Japanese government bonds, exactly the opposite to what my profession predicted. And the other element is that the Bank of Japan were the first really to engage in large scale purchase of government bonds in the secondary market and in effect, they've been funding fiscal def these large fiscal deficits. They've been funding them with money creation. Uh, and the, my profession calls that printing money, which is erroneous. And they say that that, that would eventually lead to a loss of credibility of the central bank and sell out of the currency and all the rest of it. Well, none of that's been happening. There hasn't been accelerating inflation. There's been the opposite. And the Bank of Japan has maintained total controls of all yields and interest rates, just as it always can. And the reality is that uh, this fictional world that my profession uh, uh, relies on us believing in can't explain anything about the real world. And Japan has pushed policy parameters to their extremes, relative extremes, and none of the predictions of the mainstream have occurred. And, and why? Because it's a fictional world they deal in. And uh, here's a really nice quote from, it's a recent quote from Martin Wolf. He's a Financial Times journalist in Britain. And he's talking about MMT. In my view, it is right and wrong. It is right because there's no simple budget constraint. It is wrong because it will prove impossible to manage an economy sensibly one pol once politicians believe there's no budget constraint. There's your fictional world. But that's not the first time. Here's another quote from a very famous mainstream economist, Paul Samuelson. He was interviewed by Mark Blaug in 1988. I think there's an element of truth in the view that, superstition, that the superstition at the budget must be balanced at all times. Once it is, is debunked, 
takes away one of the bulwarks that every society must have against expenditure out of control, there must be discipline. Otherwise you'll get uh, chaos and inefficiency. And one of the functions, very important, and one of the functions of old fashioned religion was to scare people by sometimes, uh, uh, by thinking sometimes what might be regarded as myths into behaving that way, uh, in the way uh, uh, that long run civilized life requires. So it's very clear that they think it was appropriate and they still think it's appropriate to leave the public in the dark by creating, you know, the old fashioned religion was to scare people. The myths were to scare people into, into social conformity and into conforming in the, the, the way in which the dominant paradigm wants you to behave, to serve their interests, not yours. Okay, what's MMT then? And there's uh, uh, um, about 10 more minutes uh, maximum. So uh, th it's important to understand. I mean, I hear all the time and you're seeing it in the press now, even uh, Philip Lowe, the central bank governor was talking in this way this week in Australia, that, oh, if we have MMT, it'll be a disaster. If we shift to MMT, won't it be great, depending on which side of the fence you sit? The, the reality is that it makes no sense to talk about shifting to MMT or that MMT is some regime you can turn on or off or that MMT is a set of policies that you can adopt or not adopt. What MMT is, is a lens. It's a, it's a means of understanding the world that we have out there. The modern monetary system that uses fiat currencies not currencies that are convertible into gold. That's the point I made earlier about 1971. And that what that lens exposes is the ideology that sits behind policy. Go back to those two quotes I just gave you. What MMT allows you to do with this superior lens is to see very clearly what the capacities of the currency issuing government are and what the consequences of using those capacities in one way or another, austerity or not, or whatever, uh, what the consequences of, of policy choices are. And it lets you see through statements that are, uh, that, oh, we can't do this because we don't have enough money. Where's the money going to come from? All of these uh, things, that uh, statements that support the fiction, MMT allows you to see right through those. Now, to operationalise that understanding into policy, you have to impose a set of values. So for a person on the left who believes in collectives and public goods and uh, 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 egalitarianism and those sort of values, they, their MMT understanding will lead to quite a different policy set than if you're someone on the right who believes in individualism and a lack of collective action and private endeavour rather than public goods and what have you. But the two, two people would have exactly the same understanding of MMT in the monetary system. They would just use that understanding for a different set of policies. So what does it mean to have your own currency? What it means, and New Zealand government has its own currency, it means that there's no intrinsic financial constraint. The New Zealand government can buy anything that's for sale in its currency, including all idle labour. The government's not like a household, so that one of the mainstream fictions is that, oh, the government's just a big household. And that, that plays into our own experience as householders managing our finances. And we know we can't max out our credit card, otherwise we'll be in trouble down the road. The, the, and we, we, we're, we're asked to sort of extrapolate that experience as household financial managers into making assessments about what the uh, capacities of the, and options of the currency issuing government are. It's just totally a false analogy. We use the currency, we're financially constrained. The government issues the currency, it has no financial constraints. And so once you understand that, you realise that if there's idle labour, that's a political choice, it's not a financial constraint. The government could employ all idle labour that wants jobs, if it chose to. And, and what MMT 
allows you to understand is what actually constrains government spending as opposed to the fiction or things that oh, will run out of money or how do we pay for it type uh, constraints that, that drive the political process and our political decision making. Um, and I'm just, go, just going to, uh, I just got to go back one step, sorry. Yeah. And so what we, what we uh, once you have an MMT understanding, you realise that taxes don't fund spending. Taxes serve another purpose. I'll come to in a second. Public debt doesn't fund spending. Public debt is just an elaborate form of corporate welfare. The New Zealand government can never run out of money. And the deficits generate income and saving in the non-government sector. And surpluses do exactly the opposite. They kill income growth and they destroy private wealth. So what constrains government spending? The first thing we need to understand is that all spending carries an inflation risk, not just government spending, private household consumption, business investment, export revenue, it all carries risk. And that that risk is embodied in the fact that if spending in the economy, private or public, uh, outstrips the capacity of the uh, economy to respond to that spending growth by producing real goods and services, th th then there'll be inflationary pressures. Prior to that point, there won't be any inflationary pressures coming from the spending. Now, what are the constraints? Here's a little example. Uh, uh, a, a choice set to allow us to see very clearly some important points. Uh, here's two, two states. Is the economy fully employed? That means are all productive resources being used? And, and does the nation enjoy monetary sovereignty? Money sovereignty means that you issue your own currency, central bank sets the interest rates, you don't borrow in a foreign currency. Uh, those those at things are, respons uh, are necessary for uh, monetary sovereignty plus floating it on freely on exchange, uh, foreign exchange markets. So New Zealand government is clearly monetarily sovereign. Germany, for example, isn't because it uses the euro, which is a foreign currency to them. So here's very briefly some situations. If we answer yes to those two questions, then what are the constraints on government spending more? The constraints are real. What does that mean? It means this, that all the resources that are the productive resources are currently being fully employed. If the government wants a greater command of those resources, let's say it wants to increase the size of government to pursue a green transition or something like that, then if it starts trying to compete with the existing users of those resources at market prices, uh, and trying to buy them, hire them to work in the public sector, then there'll be inflation. So the real, real resource constraint is hit at that point, and that's the limits of government spending. So if the government really wanted to run a, gr a program where it increases its command of the productive resources available to the, in the economy, it has to work out a way to deprive the non-government sector who are currently using them of use. And there's many ways it can do that, but a very important way is through taxation. And taxation effectively reduces the non-government purchasing power, which creates those unemployment in those real resources, which can then be brought into the public back into productive use by government spending. And so that gives you an insight into what the role of taxation is, one of the roles of taxation. It's not to fund government spending. The government doesn't need the tax revenue to spend because it, it types numbers into bank accounts every day and that's how our currency enters the economy. But it needs that taxation to, to constrain private spending so that it doesn't push the economy, uh, spending in the economy beyond the resource constraint. Take this example. So now we've got idle resources as in most economies now. Uh, there are no constraints on increasing government spending. And so when there's unemployed resources, there's underemployment, uh, uh, there's uh, machines are not working in the private sector, then the responsibility of government, then it has no constraints on its spending, is to type numbers and run programs into 
type numbers into bank accounts and run programs up to the point where they get back to answering yes to that question, in other words, full employment. That's the responsibility of a government uh, in, a, in a democracy, in my view. It has no constraints. So all of the arguments that they might come out with is how are we going to pay for it and all that, they're just fictions. They're nonsense. They pay for it by typing numbers into bank accounts for procurement contracts, uh, cash transfers and all the rest of it. And, it. and until they get back to being at full employment, there are no constraints on spending. Uh, now, what the main, what, for a country like Germany, for example, in the Eurozone, the 19 member states, even when they're at uh, full employment, they have financial constraints as well as real constraints because they don't issue their own currency. And so they're dependent on bond markets to fund deficits. And, uh, uh, and that, that financial constraint doesn't disappear even when there's idle resources, which is why surrendering your currency like the Eurozone countries did was, is a disastrous thing for an, a, a nation state to do. Because even if they've got idle resources, like mass unemployment as they've got now, the bond markets can still hold them to ransom and they can't do anything about it. Okay, so the last couple of uh, minutes, I'll just talk about uh, uh, options with, uh, on what, how governments can use that spending. Uh, essentially, a currency issuing government like New Zealand has two choices if it wants to sta have a stable inflation environment. It can either use what I call an unemployment buffer stock or it can employ, use an employment buffer stock. Now, at the moment, the New Zealand government and most governments use an unemployment buffer stock. What does that mean? It means that when there's inflationary pressures in the economy, the government will tighten fiscal policy, the central bank will push up interest rates and they will deliberately create unemployment to discipline wage demands, to squeeze profit margins in the product markets, and that disciplines the wage price type spiral pressures in the economy. And the, the problem is that that is an incredibly costly approach because using unemployment not only re results in massive daily income losses, it also has a whole series of personal and family and community pathologies, crime rates, mental and physical health, family breakdown, uh, uh, social dislocation, all of those things that sociologists and psychologists tell us about. So, and the other problem is that if you then try to ease the unemployment, you may well trigger the inflationary spiral then. So it's a really costly way uh, to discipline inflation. The alternative is to use an employment buffer stock. What does that mean? That means that the government offers an unconditional job offer to any worker that doesn't have a job, and that job offer is at a social inclusive minimum wage. It's a, it's a, and, and in other words, it's at the bottom of the wage distribution in the economy, which is adjusted upwards if necessary to ensure that the lowest paid workers have, have the ability to participate in society, socially included, inclusive wage, which means that it's not a poverty wage. It means that they, they can, a minimum wage worker can have a holiday, can go out to dinner occasionally, can go to the football or to the to music or whatever. They, they, they can participate in society. But the important point of that is that the, the government is buying off the bottom of the market because the unemployed workers have what we call zero bid in the market. Nobody wants their services. And so by buying those workers uh, in the job guarantee, the government is buying a resource that has no bid for it and therefore that, that spending can't be inflationary. And, and ultimately, uh, why it's a buffer stock is because when the private sector is stronger, uh, it can then bid the workers back out into the private sector, back out of the job guarantee, and the buffer stock would contract. Now, in normal times, at, at high pressure economy times, the buffer stock would be relatively small. Because if you think back to how, the, uh, how Western governments achieved full employment in the post-war period, 
It wasn't because the private sector was strong. That strong career public sector. It was because most governments around the world maintained a small buffer of jobs always available. In Australia, it was in the local government, in railways, in the big utilities, the infrastructure utilities like roads and housing. And these, you could always get a job in those areas on any time you wanted. And those jobs contracted and expanded depending how strong the private economy was. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, the, the, the advantages of a job guarantee over a unemployment buffer stock approach is uh, uh, um, a massive. Uh, and I've listed some of them there. You, you can have, choose your hours of work. So you eliminate time-based underemployment. You can participate in career and training development. Uh, uh, you can uh, um, target the jobs because they're unconditional. They, they are spatially targeted. So you don't get this problem of hollowing out of regional areas in our, in our countries. You can make them green. Uh, uh, a massive advantage is a second point there that uh, one of the real problems of children growing up in jobless households, especially long-term jobless households, we know from the research evidence is that they, they in, inherit the disadvantage of their parents. And so by, be, by seeing their parents always being able to work, that, that, stigma and that disadvantage, intergenerational disadvantage is not as pronounced if it, if pronounced if if existing at all now that's in bold here it's not a panacea to everything it's the base position that any government should adopt and and i and i'm not saying that the response to this pandemic should be just a job guarantee job guarantee should be a permanent safety net and uh if you want to have uh uh, you, you don't want to see it as the only uh, government response to unemployment. There's so much uh, work to be done in improving the scope and quality of public services uh, that we need career public servants being re-employed uh, to redress that, the problems of that neoliberal report card. The job guarantee is just a small part of it and it's inf infinitely better than buffer stock option. Uh, and the last point I'd make is that a lot of people are really uh, up in arms about the concept of a duty to work. Now, I'm of the ilk that says that in a, a society based upon collective values, uh, where the government has a responsibility to ensure that everybody can have a job, then the citizens in that economy, that society, have a duty to contribute to the well-being of the society through their endeavours, uh, and a lot of people, a lot of progressives, find that offensive. They believe that a person should have the right to opt out and still get income support. The way I th see it is that at the moment our societies haven't evolved to the point where the majority of people, especially the working, the, the traditional working class, are not in not yet ready to accept people who can work not working and still receiving an income from the state everybody understands that if you're sick if you're old if you're young if you're disabled then you should be fully supported well not everybody but every progressive thinks should be fully supported by the state at a very uh, substantial level to ensure that their lives have have uh, meaning in uh, relative to the the rest of society but I don't believe the working class is yet ready to accept people who can work receiving a state uh, payment and not contributing at all and relying on the work efforts of others for their consumption goods and their leisure goods. But what we do need is a, a massive re-evaluation of the concept of productivity, what is meaningful work. And the job guarantee allows us within the paid work culture that I just mentioned, to really push the boundaries as to what we would allow to be within the, uh, an employment buffer stock. And to give you the, the, as a closing point to think about, uh, I live just uh, very close to the, one, one, some of the best surf beaches in Australia on the East Coast. Uh, 
and I would allow surfers to be in the job guarantee. Now, what would they do? They'd go surfing, of course. Now, what else would they do by way of reciprocation to the collective? Well, one of the problems in our summers here is uh, water safety and people drowning. And who best knows the uh, 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 dangers of the water than surfers? We jump in the rips to get out quickly. And so I would have uh, surfers surfing and enjoying their lives and being creative in the waves, but I'd also have them required to take uh, water safety training sessions for school kids. Highly productive, totally outside the box of what we currently consider to be productive work, but that's a way of pushing the agenda towards a much more collective, leisure-based uh, society without violating the current paid work culture. Okay, so that's all I've got to say. Uh, I, I've got some, um, I can talk about New Zealand itself. I've got some graphs there, but uh, I think that's enough and I'll take questions. Hey, thank you very, very much, Bill. That was um, extremely, extremely- I'm gonna stop good. sharing. Uh, have you stopped sharing? Yep. yep. Okay, great. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Bill. That's uh, absolutely um, illuminating. Um, and thank you very, very much for that. Um, and, and maybe if there's interest from the um, floor, we'll look at some of those New Zealand uh, stats as we uh, discuss what's, uh, um, what you've um, covered. Uh, what I'll ask people to do is if you have a, a question in mind, um, feel free to raise your hand. Um, I can't necessarily physically see you if you raise your hand physically uh, because um, I can't see what's on all the screens. But uh, do please uh, use that blue symbol or the raise hand symbol and uh, fire away either with a question uh, to Bill or the audience. Or as I mentioned, we do uh, allow uh, comments as well, but please keep them to um, a couple of minutes or I'll, I'll certainly help you keep them to a couple of minutes. Um, uh, Jeff, um, you've got your hand up. I'll uh, take your question first. Right. Thanks, Martin. Um, I've got two questions to ask, and they're on different parts of the presentation. Um, one of them is about the limits to the buffer stock, uh, because I understand the point you make about surfers, but I am aware that a large part of the labour a large part of the population lie outside the labour force but with a job guarantee scheme, potentially might come into the labour force. I'm thinking particularly of housewives um, and other unpaid care workers who, for whom there's a strong case that they're socially highly productive, uh, but there's enough of them to produce a real problem if they're allowed access into your job buffer scheme. And the second question that I have is to do with the, uh, the downstream consequences of large-scale deficit financing, which we are confronting here in New Zealand as well as you are in Australia. Um, we've got about 60 billion of government deficit financing going into the economy over the next couple of years and coming to rest as $60 billion of settlement cash balances, uh, which if out in the longer run represent excess balances and potentially represent uh, unwanted spending if the economy comes back to full employment. And I'm just wondering, looking downstream, uh, how the exit strategy from a, 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 a deficit-led recovery looks in terms of mopping up any excess liquidity that you're left, left with at the end of the day when we get back to full employment. Thanks. Okay, so um, thanks for the question. Um, I don't see any problem of, uh, of people doing, currently doing unpaid housework. Uh, being employed within a job guarantee. What's the problem? They'd get an income for doing work where, you know, there's a major issue where you have uh, uh, people doing childcare being paid an income because that's considered to be part of the market economy. But people who, who are doing their own childcare aren't considered doing, doing the same thing effectively and aren't being paid. I can't see any problem with that. And, uh, I think that would go a long way to redress some of the issues that uh, my feminist colleagues uh, rail against uh, uh, the inequity of, of that situation, the lack of recognition of particularly mothers uh, uh, work, 
looking after their kids and not being uh, recognised as part of the productive workforce. I think they're highly productive and um, I can't see any problem with that. And, and, and equally, a lot of people are, uh, a lot of particularly mothers, but it might also open up a better choice set for, for fathers uh, are for, forced into the sort of precarious work, the gig economy to uh, uh, supplement their, their home caring time. And if you allowed them to be in job guarantee, they, they, they would be uh, protected from that sort of uh, need to go to work in that sense. So I can't see it's a problem. I, I, uh, that's the first point. Uh, the second point is that um, you have, and, and I'll be, and I'm being polite here, because we're all adults. You've um, you've bought the fictional world by saying you're very worried about uh, the the liquidity. So I'm presuming you're thinking that oh, what's going, what happens when a government runs deficits? Is that it adds reserves to the the banking system? Uh, all the tr all the transactions that occurred because of the higher economic uh, uh, this higher spending and the activity that that generates ultimately show up in bank reserves. Now, does that matter? Well, that let's think about how Japan's handled that over 30 years, not not just one year or five years, 30 years. And what what effect if you've got excess reserves? So what are reserves? Reserves are accounts that the private banks have to keep with the central bank. And their, their function is purely to ensure that the daily transactions across banks will clear. It, you know, think about it as checks clearing. And so there's all sorts of transactions between bank A and bank B and, and they resolve themselves every day of every working day through transactions uh, contra entries among these reserve balances that the banks keep. Banks don't lend out reserves. That's the myth, one of the myths that uh, uh, the mainstream of my profession perpetuate. Bank, banks can't lend out reserves. Reserves are only allowed to be used for the uh, clearing function and or banks on an overnight basis can lend to each other reserves if they're short or have too many. Now, the problem for banks is that reserves typically don't earn a competitive rate of return. And so for them, it's dead money. And what, so if a bank has a lot of transactions that are in their favour on any day, they'll come up with excess reserves. And uh, well, they'll try then to loan, find other banks on the interbank market. It's, this is an overnight market where they, they transact between each other, they will try to lend, find a bank that has a, a shortage of reserves on any particular day to lend them out, to try to get a return. But of course, if there's an excess overall, those intra-bank transactions can't eliminate it. And so what happens is the competitive process of trying to eliminate it drives the short-term interest rate down to zero. Now, for a, for a central bank who wants, a, say, a 4% policy monetary target, then a, as a short-term target, that's a problem. So what does a central bank have to do in that case? It has two options. It can traditionally do an open market operation. What does that mean? It says to the banks with excess reserves, we'll sell you a government bond uh, in exchange for those reserves. And so the government debt is sold to the, the banks to ge generate a, a competitive yield, stop them trying to lend out their reserves. And the, the excess is drained out of the system. Now, in more recent times, what central banks have been doing is just saying, okay, we'll just pay you a return on excess reserves, which is functionally the same thing. It stops that process occurring. What did they do in Japan? They just let the excess reserves sit in the system and drive the, that's how they maintain zero interest rates at the short end of the yield curve, the short run interest rates. That's how they do it. And the problems, there's no problem. There's no, ex, 
the excess reserves that are sitting there in the banking system. Now, the myth is that, oh, well, won't, won't people just uh, go crazy and use those excess reserves to spend wildly? Well, they can't, they can't spend the reserves. That, that's not the way the reserve system works. And so the question then is, well, they've got financial assets that, ex that are expressed in those reserves. Yes, they have. What happens if they, if they liquidate those assets? Okay, they'll sell them for cash and then they might spend. And if they do that, then the growth of the economy will rise, tax revenue will increase, welfare spending will decrease, and the deficit will go down anyway. So, and, and ultimately, there is no problem in running continuous fiscal deficits until the cows come home. The Australian government and most governments around the world have always run deficits. And the reason they have to run deficits, and, and some of those graphs I had for you, if we wanted them, one graph shows that New Zealand, like Australia, runs a continuous current account deficit of about, I think in your case, about 3% of GDP. In Australia's case, a bit over three and a half. We've been doing that for a long time. Now, what does that mean? A current account deficit or an external deficit means that there's more income flowing out of the economy than it's coming in, more spending going out than coming in. That drains spending from the domestic economy. Now, if you want, if you want the private domestic sector, the household sector and the business firms, if you want them to be able to save overall, which means you don't want them to get to be accumulating increasing amounts of debt, then with an external deficit, you have to run a fiscal deficit. There's no other way around it. And in the full employment era, we had non-government, private domestic sector typically saving overall, despite strong investment rates because household saving ratios were high. We had external deficits and we had consistent, continuous fiscal deficits supporting the income of growth to allow the private sector to save. Now, for New Zealand at the moment, you've been pushing sur fiscal surpluses. And the only way your economy is being able to grow with your external deficits is because you've got record levels of household debt. And it's the household debt that's been driving consumption growth in running up against the fiscal drag from the surpluses and the drain of spending through your external account. Now that's an unsustainable situation because eventually the private sector balance sheets become so precarious that the smallest changes in the environment, in employment or interest rates or whatever, start triggering insolvencies. And so it's best for a country to not drive growth on ever increasing levels of household debt, which effectively means you, if you, especially if you need have an external deficit, means you need continuous fiscal deficits. There's no other way around it. Thank, thanks, Bill. Um, uh, Jeff, you got your hand up again. Did you have a uh, just a one final? Yeah, I just want to very quickly to come back, um, particularly on that on your last point. Um, I, I agree with you in all the detail of what you said. I still raise the question that I raised at the outset about excess balances. Uh, our banking system operates perfectly satisfactorily with $8 billion of settlement cash balances. That's enough to clear all the overnight transactions. There's nothing more than that required. We're running up towards $60 billion of those things. At the end of the day, uh, uh, we will end up paying on those settlement cash balances, um, either a rate of return roughly equal to government bond rates, or we're seeing them converted into government bonds throughout market operations on which then we will have to pay servicing costs. And uh, one way or the other, uh, if you put 60 billion, it could be, could be 100 billion looking forward now, uh, into the system and it comes through a settlement cash balance as you do at the end of the day, um, have to carry a servicing cost on that amount, even though the settlement cash balances themselves can't be directly used for spending. And I think the um, the concern that I'm that I'm putting forward to you um, is to do with the with the the claim that by running fiscal deficits now you incur long run obligation servicing obligations for the fiscal 
system. And uh, it seems to me that if you tax the settlement cash balances away and thereby eliminate them, that's fine. You've got rid of the long run obligation. If you can find a way of writing them off, um, again, you're okay. If you go forward paying zero rate of return on the settlement cash balances and can keep them sterilized, that's okay. Um, my concern simply is that uh, if, you've, if you have that much accumulated settlement cash, uh, it can convert into problems down the track, including an increased uh, fiscal burden of servicing them. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm not criticizing you for this. I, it's, a, it's something I'm wrestling with myself. And so if you can help me think my way through it, I'd be grateful. Well, just think of the way Japan's managed the situation. That's what I'd tell you. It's 30 years now. They, they've understood that the central bank can control all yields if it wants to, uh, including making them negative if they want to. Now, I'm not saying that's desirable, but that's what the central bank has. The bond markets are not the power force. It's the central bank that's the power force. And what increasingly is happening, happening is the central banks are buying the debt in the secondary markets anyway. And uh, so you've now got increasing situations where governments, the right pocket of government, the treasury, is owing money to the left pocket of government, the central bank. Because remember, the central bank's not independent of government. Uh, it's, it's part of government. And so you, in the end, you're getting situation like for Japan since 2012, the Bank of Japan has basically bought all the debt that's issued. And so it's, it, you know, what, what's, what could happen there? Well, I mean, it's left and right pocket stuff going on here. And, and uh, the central bank, if, if, if the scenario was that uh, the interest payments were going to become too onerous relative to the, the, fit, the size in which the fiscal deficit would have to be to maintain full employment. So, you know, you could imagine some weird situation where interest payments were so huge that they crowded out the ability to fund education, for example. It's not likely to ever happen. The government could just set interest rates at zero. And, and as you say, no, no yield, no debt burden. But the other thing to think about, and, and this is the way in which MMT thinks rather than mainstream, is to invert the logic. What's government debt and what are the interest payments on it? Well, we, we all talk about burden, but it's actually our wealth and our income. And if the government, and, and if the government is paying interest payments on, on, on its obligations one way or another, whether it's through, through issued debt or through paying excess uh, returns on excess reserves, that's private income. And the only issue that progressive should be having there is who's getting that income and where's the wealth being stored. It's wealth in the non-government sector is good. The, the issue is the distribution of the wealth, not the existence of it. And so that I'm, I can't see any scenario where uh, excess reserves in the banking system can turn negative for a, for a society if the government manages them properly. Okay, thanks, thanks, Bill, and uh, thanks, Jeff, for that uh, question or series of questions. Um, Robert, you've uh, had your hand up for a bit. Thank you very much, Bill. Um, the ecological footprint worldwide is something like uh, one point seven five. So, as a as a whole, we are living beyond the resources of the world to uh, uh, sustain life. So, where does um, coming back within that uh, envelope of the capacity of the earth to support human activity. Where does that figure in your scheme? Yeah, I think that's a really important question. And, uh, and I think it goes to the heart of understanding the difference between the, the current mainstream and what I would call a, a progressive ideology. And the current mainstream, and you know, particularly the way economists, mainstream economists, think about the natural environment, for example, is to consider it to be a, a, a resource that can be extracted to produce income in the economy. And you know, I mean, in environmental economics, we're taught things about the trade-off that, oh, pollution's bad, but income's good. So we'll just get a merry trade-off. 
And the, the way I've always thought about it is that, uh, um, you know, mainstream economists derive all of these uh, technical concepts of optimal degrees of pollution and optimal degrees of extraction. And the way I always thought about it was that uh, uh, I, I don't know when a river system is going to die. I don't know when a biological system has been pushed beyond its limits. So, and so the idea that you can just keep pushing a trade off uh, seems to me to be an incredibly dangerous concept. And the way I think about uh, uh, economics is that the economics, the economic system is us. It's not something divorced from us that we have to be slaves to or the natural environment has to be slaves to, a slave to. The, the economy is only there to, to advance our material prosperity. We, and we are embedded in a natural environment that is, and our prosperity is conditional on that natural, in, natural environment. So what's gonna be required, I think, is uh, a massive transformation in production and income, um, uh, consumption patterns that uh, honor the fact that we've been uh, trashing our natural environment for the sake of material prosperity. Now that doesn't mean A lot of a lot of uh, green progressives then say, "Oh, what you be, mean zero growth?" Well, no, I don't mean zero growth at all. I mean green growth, because unless we're growing popular, unless you're going to stop population growth altogether, which is not going to happen, it'll happen over time as ageing occurs. But unless you're going to uh, uh, with, with growing populations, particularly distributed in uh, spatial geospatially. Uh, we're going to have to continue to grow. It's, it, otherwise, we're saying that the future generation is going to have less opportunities than us. But we, we're sophisticated enough, I would have thought, to be able to manage that uh, employment growth and those opportunities within a green future rather than a carbon future. And I, and, and I firmly believe that there's so many, you know, so many things that are going to be required to be done. Uh, you know, think about aging societies, the personal care services are going to become huge in the next 20, 30 years. And personal care services can be all green type activities, but be highly productive and, and highly beneficial to society, but leave no footprint. Thanks, thanks, Bill, and thanks, uh, Robert, for that question, uh, that excellent question, actually. Um, uh, Warwick, uh, you put your hand up. Thank you. Uh, I think this whole thing makes sense because if you lend, the government issues um, money to buy, to pay people to, say, build state houses, that only adds value. So you're creating more goods and services. You're also creating more money, but that can't be inflationary from my, from my viewpoint. But I think we've got a bit of a marketing problem. About 10 years ago, there were people standing for parliament out here called um, positive money. And you just sort of think, oh yeah, that sounds like social credit. Mm -hmm. So what's the difference between Modern monetary theory, positive money, and social credit. Well, in response to your first point, uh, you know, one of the things that I've been arguing with my government here over the last few months is Australia's got a shortage of about four hundred thousand uh, social housing shortage. Yeah. Uh, because of the years of. Uh, of de-investment by governments in social housing in the attempt to force low income workers into private markets. So uh, there's a massive opportunity in this pandemic, uh, which, which has short term problems, independent of the health issue, but the short term problems of income loss and all the rest of it, 
is to use the fiscal stimulus that's required to, to look after longer term problems like, like the environment, public infrastructure for carbon transition, but also social housing. But don't think for one minute that the production of social housing is, is, doesn't uh, engage a, an inflation risk. Under, at the moment, not, because there's idle capacity. But at, at, go back to that choice set I provided. At full if you have a stronger economy and you want to expand social housing, and, and start absorbing construction resources from, the, from their current uses, then if you try to do that and just by offering contracts to constructors to build social housing, uh, then you will run into an inflation barrier. So you've always got to be aware that depending upon the state of the economy, government programs can be can be more or less risky in terms of inflation. At the moment, that's not a risk at all, but at some other point it might be. Uh, now, in terms of positive money and MMT, uh, somewhat different. Uh, the, the major difference is that positive money wants to eliminate the credit creation capacities of private banks. And um, my view on that is if they, uh, so they want banks to only be able to lend uh, deposits that they currently can attract and not be able to leverage in a fractional reserve type way uh, uh, bank lending. Now, mm -hmm. I happen to quite like my credit card. It means that I no longer have to have all these uh, coins in my pocket and that I can, uh, uh, as, as long as I'm careful each month, I can pay it off without paying interest. Now that comes from the bank's credit creating capacity. And uh, my view is that if you adopted a positive money recommendation and eliminate the private bank's credit creation capacity, we would have, we would have uh, a huge recession immediately because uh, uh, businesses wouldn't be able to run overdrafts anymore and get working capital and consumers would uh, uh, not be able to, uh, across time, balance their spending and their income flows in, in a way that they chose. And, and, and quite frankly, there's enough regulation and uh, authoritarian type imposts upon our choices in society. And I wouldn't want that to be another one. Uh, uh, regulation's great if it's uh, for collective good, that wouldn't be for, for collective good. And, and you know, I mean, the, the, the sentiment of the positive money group is, uh, is, is reasonable that they are worried that the, the bankers have become banksters, uh, like gangsters, and uh, that they are uh, responsible for uh, speculative bubbles and, and, and fraud and all the rest of it that we found out during the global financial crisis and beyond. And, you know, the Royal Commission in Australia into the financial sector recently has found incredible abuses of the banks and the, and the uh, insurance companies and what have you. And so, you know, my view is that if you want the banks to behave properly, but still retain their credit creation capacity, then you need to make sure that they behave as banks and not casinos because what they're doing at the moment under the financial deregulation is uh, uh, you know they can bundle up all these uh, loans into securitized assets and flog them off to as derivative assets to unsuspecting uh, investors and take them off their balance sheet and therefore shift create the risk and then shift the risk and not be responsible for it. Whereas my view is that if you want banks to be banks, then they have got to hold all their decisions on their own balance sheets and their shareholders have to be responsible for it. And I'd go one step further and say, I would eliminate private banking. If effectively private banks, uh, uh, the banking system is really a public private partnership as it exists now, the so-called too big to fail idea. That, uh, that, uh, that there's no need, in my view, uh, private bank, uh, banking as, a, as a, 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 um, a resource is sort of like a public good to me. 
and uh, I would have, uh, uh, as a transition phase, I would reintroduce a, a public bank and, th and that bank would then set the discipline for the sector and make all of the private banks conform to a much more uh, secure, uh, non-speculative type of behaviour. And then if you wanted to go further and have just no public bank, private banks, then I would support that. But the problem's not the credit creation of banks. The problem is that the banks are no longer banks, they're casinos. And you can have the credit creation, which helps people, consumers, have choices over time. I like my credit card. It gives me extra choices. And, uh, uh, but I don't like banks being casinos. That's my answer to your question. Mm. Thank you. Thanks, uh, thanks, Bill, and thanks, Warwick, for that question. Um, I'm, uh, if you're okay, Bill, I'll take one more question because Jane's yep. had her uh, hand up, but we'll make that the last. Um, it's uh, 3.30, 1.30 your time, and uh, thank you for that. But Jane, would you like to, um, uh, to give us a quick question or comment? Yes, indeed. Thank you very much. Um, First of all, I'd just quickly like to say thank you to the Fabians for putting this on and Bill in particular for making himself available. It was really interesting. My question though is, um, Bill, do you have any advice on how we can best spread this information? And I'm particularly thinking that as depending on what happens with COVID-19, we've got a general election coming up in New Zealand just next month. Yeah, well, I mean, this is the perennial, and, and thanks for your comment, this is the perennial problem. We've been confronting this for 25 years. Uh, when when a couple of us started out on this journey, the MMT thing, and, you know, the, that point about the group thing, I, I skated over it, of course, but I've written quite a lot about it. And uh, it's, a, it's an incredible constraint, uh, uh, shifting, mindsets it's it takes a long time and uh uh you know the way when we started i started this with an american and a couple of americans came in very early on the project and and um commensurate with their culture they were very enthusiastic uh that that all we needed to do is get this stuff out there and uh, everyone would quickly s jump now I'd studied philosophy of science, of course, and I and, and I I think I understood that paradigms don't shift very quickly at all. And I said to them, "No, this is the mid '90s. That no, this is a long haul. This is an edu education as a slow burn, and this is a really long haul process. And I think we're still in that process, although there's." quite clearly a lot of disparate forces now uh, totally dissatisfied with mainstream economics but we're up against you know mainstream economics didn't come out of nowhere uh, if you go if you've studied economics you'll know that a lot of this literature that we still talk about today came about in the late 19th century when when industrialists hired economists to come up with uh, theories that make capitalism look fair. And why did they want to do that? Because Marxism was starting to run rife in, in Europe and, and uh, you know, 1848 revolutions and the, the 1871 Paris Commune. These were real threats to the capitalist hegemony and uh, uh, because workers were starting to work out that the distribution of income was incredibly unfair that they were working for hours in sweatshops for minimal pay and the bosses were pissing off with the surpluses for doing nothing other than owning the capital. And that was deeply offensive to a sense of sort of justice and egalitarianism. And so mainstream economics isn't just a, a random invention. It's, it serves the purposes of, of capital and always has been. In the fictional world they've created, uh, nobody asks, how, how's the government going to pay for when they when they put trillions of dollars in into into the system to save the banks in 2008 and save the salaries of the CEOs? No one asks where's the money coming from when they buy uh, f feed the military industrial complex and then go and invade countries like Iraq and Afghanistan. They always ask how it's going to pay for when they uh, want to increase the unemployment benefit from two bob to two, and a, two, two shillings and sixpence. 
and and so that's the that's the problem we're up we're up against a power elite and i'm increasingly forming the view and i'm acting on this view in the australian setting in sort of some political endeavors we're getting involved in my view is that we have a a capacity now that we've never had before because we don't in the past we haven't controlled the media but social social the internet is is a much more democratizing force and 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 we can organize look at us today we're talking 100 people here today apparently across the tasman we're having a political discussion now and uh, I, I believe that we can uh, uh, create a grassroots movements to, to confront the power elites. There was a reason in the late 19th century why trade unions formed, and there was a re reason why welfare states became an acceptable idea that politicians couldn't resist. And that was because capitalism had pushed workers too far. And uh, they were faced with, with, with overthrow and re revolution. And I think we're at the point now, that neoliberal report card tells me and the revolts that are going on around the world, Brexit, look at how could you elect a president like Trump? Well, that's just an anti-establishment revolt. That's a breakdown of the power elites and the, and the command over the, the elites. So my view is that we've just got to exploit the internet, the, the capacity to organise by the internet and to educate. Everybody should, and that's why I said at the beginning, we all should learn macroeconomics and learn it properly because that's a way we can confront our polity who tells us we can't afford to do this. Well, of course, we've, New Zealand government's got as many dollars as it wants. What it will struggle to have is real resources. That's your constraint, always. Thank you for that. Thanks, and thanks I'll very much. I'll take it on board. I'll do my best. <laughs> good. Uh, that was a great uh, closing question. Uh, thank you, Jane. That very, very good. And Bill, um, really appreciate your time uh, opening that uh, Trans-Tasman dialogue. Um, thank you very, very much, everybody. The, um, this has been recorded, so if you missed anything or you want to go back over it um, or you want to share it with uh, those who uh, couldn't be online, um, we'll get the, uh, the link out in the next 24 hours. And um, thank you very, very much. Bill, we'll let you get back uh, to your uh, lunch. And um, we'll see everyone else um, at the next, uh, the next session. Uh, and meanwhile, go out and enjoy the rest of your weekend. Thank you. Thank you.